When it comes to composition, I think there's a couple of things that could be said, and there's a couple of pathways to success. On the one hand, you can study the principles of academic composition, theoretical composition, ways that people have overlaid existing images that work and tried to kind of figure out why they have succeeded. I think these rules are really useful and it's worthwhile knowing them all. You can't really go wrong. The other thing that tends to work is just sketching, trying to create thumbnails and thinking about how you specifically are going to create the ideas in your head. Because I think on this channel, I'm all about drawing from imagination, creating illustrations and trying to get the ideas from here onto the page. The only way to do that is really to practice actually creating thumbnails, planning images. You could think of this as book smarts versus street smarts. Although in this case, I think there's a good way that you can actually do a bit of both and look at some books to get some street smarts. What I'm going to do in this video is look at some actual art and we're going to try and perceive the compositional ideas that are actually involved here. More specifically in this video, I want to discuss the idea of abstract versus narrative composition and how different artists use it to solve their problems. This is going to be a laid back video. We're just going to look at some of these different books and look at the creative illustration book, try and see whether we can understand how these ideas are actually being employed. And this way I can show you with visuals because one of the things I've learned certainly is that it's one thing to understand all of these things like formal, informal composition, understand all these lines and get it in your head. It's another thing to actually notice when it is being used in the world around you. And it is further another thing to actually be able to employ it. And I think you kind of need to do a little bit of both. Although I do recommend that you spend most of your time actually just sketching. Because I think that's really what works. So you can follow along with me as I explore this idea visually. Narrative versus abstract composition. But I'd also really like to know what you think about this idea. So drop some ideas in the comments down below about what artists you think are really good examples of people who deal with narrative and people who deal with abstract composition. And I think ideally people who are able to blend both of these ideas really effectively. So try and think about this as we go through it, the more you can think about this and start to notice where these sort of drawing theory things kind of actually appear in the world around you, the more you can start to think a little bit more like an artist and an illustrator. Anyway, let's jump in, get started. All right, welcome to The Drawing Codex. My name is Tim McBurney. I've been a professional working artist for over 20 years. And on this channel, we're all about drawing cool stuff from our imagination, embracing the challenge of drawing and mastering the craft of line and color illustration. Now, if you'd like to learn more about illustration and picture making, you can check out my free illustration mini workshop. It charts my journey going from an amateur to a professional. And I talk a lot about really important issues such as how to get more detail and polish in your work, how to plan your images, create thumbnails, and also a few thoughts on how to approach being a professional artist. As I said, it's free. The link will be in the description. Go check it out if that's something you're interested in. All right. So firstly, what I want to do is just quickly reiterate what I mean by this idea of narrative versus abstract composition. And we also quickly check out a lot of what I mean when it comes to applying compositional rules by looking at something like creative illustration by Andrew Loomis. Now, creative illustration, I think, is, is a really just sort of solid book on illustration. It kind of has like a bit of everything I think most of the information involved in this book is pretty solid, right? It, it's not necessarily anything unique, but I think it covers most of the ideas that you would find that have been talked about when it comes to composing images. I also think that Andrew Lemus is actually a very, very high level illustrator or was, and I think he provides good examples of these things being employed. So you can actually see it at work. If we look at these like different examples here, you can see that he had really, really good control of basic perspective, anatomy, figure drawing, and also illustrative composition. These things are actually very striking and his ability to you know include good abstract and narrative illustration qualities in an image, I think is, you know, look, it's really, really high level. What I mean when I'm talking about compositional rules and the need to employ them a little bit more, uh, you know, when we're dealing with these ideas, right, where we have informal composition and formal composition, we've got things like Fibonacci spirals, rule of thirds. 
The idea of informal subdivision, I think, is actually something Loomis is saying maybe he, you know, sort of came up with or it's just his idea. We're not going to dig into these in, in full sort of detail here, but let me know if you'd like to, you know, go over these a little bit more in the comments down below if any of these ideas um, you'd like more explanation on. Again, just not in the scope for this particular video, but these are the kind of ideas that I'm thinking of when I'm defining narrative versus abstract composition. And the idea there is that when we're dealing with something that's like a landscape where there's not any specific story, that's when we need to think about these things a little bit more at the outset. Although I think a lot of illustrators often just get bored and it's hard for them to come up with ideas, so they do start with these concepts sometimes. But again, this is what we're talking about. Trying to really play up the idea of using abstract marks and ways to organize an image that is in and of itself fairly simple, right? So this is a good example. We have fish here. We have this landscape plus a few people. You know, here's like just a female character sitting on a bed. These things don't necessarily have any story. But if we think about how to make them very interesting by looking at how we can position the figure and the background abstractly, then we can make a very nice, interesting image no matter what it is. So this is really what I'm talking about when it comes to leaning on the abstract compositional side of things. Now, with all of these, as we'll see with these books, as we were looking at and alluding to in the beginning, if, if you look at a lot of Loomis's actual compositional thumbnails and things, we want a mix of both, right? Everything needs to have good composition. The delineation is a matter of what you come away with as an artist, as a viewer, when you look at an image. Do you think about the story or do you just think about how pretty it is? Often when it comes to telling simple stories, it's a lot easier to use these abstract compositional ideas where we just place one thing on another because this juxtaposes ideas together and tells a story that is clearer or maybe more suited for advertising or cover work. But either way, again, I think Loomis does a really good job of showing as well as telling how these ideas should be implemented. So up next, what I'll do is I'll show you a few examples from my work and I'll sort of talk you through how I have used this delineation to, you know, just sort of help me get along in life. So here we have two different projects that I have worked on. One is a comic and there's a range of different levels of abstract versus narrative work that I would need to employ here. And here's a good example of a cover. Now, the reason that you typically need to use more abstract compositions where we're not really thinking about a story explicitly and therefore we need to kind of think really heavily, look, how do I make this look pretty? It typically with, with covers. And the reason you often need this is because I have to tell what this is about. It's a game called Mythic Arcana. How do I describe to people what the feeling of playing this game is going to be? Now, this game is... A situation where you've got a whole bunch of different characters, whole different, uh, these different pantheons of gods. And if you look at the actual artwork inside, what it is, is just a whole pile of cards, right? So it's just cards, cards, cards. There's, I think, 70 plus different cards. Now, we could also talk about, I guess, the composition of these and... The story is very simple. There is a character <laughs> sitting on a background. Very, very basic. Now, sometimes what I have done is combine elements that match the character's emotion, right? So if we look at uh, Susan or, or God of the Sea, so I'm like, well, I got to put some fishes in here, right? Again, I'm telling the story, but it's a simple story. How do I tell the story that this is the God of the Sea? Well, Again, you know, I could put them near the seaside, I could do this, but that wouldn't fit with all the rest of these. So this is where this image itself is very abstract. And this whole project is very abstract because we're dealing with the concept of deities in a board game. And this is where, again, I really have to delaminate myself from reality. I'm not drawing actual characters in actual scenes. I'm drawing like a representation of what they might look like. And I'm trying to give the viewer and the player a feeling for what that particular god and what that particular pantheon is like. So again, we lean very heavily into abstraction. And what you notice is gods from different pantheons have different colored backgrounds, etc., 
et cetera, et cetera. So this is a good example of where in order to successfully complete this illustration project, what I needed to do was really, really lean into abstraction. I can't think logically. And, and this was a big challenge for me because in the beginning, what I would be doing was, yeah, really trying to draw it as if I'm looking through a camera. And that just doesn't work with this. Similarly, when you are dealing with creating a cover, you often have to encapsulate a big idea in a single image. And often the idea is amorphous, right? Like what's the feeling you're going to be getting when you play this game? Oh, you're going to be like swimming in these different deities, right? These different pantheons. So I want to make it feel as if it's sort of dynamic and there's all this kind of stuff going on, right? It's like this rich visual experience of different deities and gods from mythology. And that is the point of this. And again, hopefully I succeeded there. Now, when we look at a comic book cover, it's similar, right? Except in this case, I, I do have to tell a little bit more about the story, about what's going on. So this one is kind of really abstract in the way it's just kind of fancy, you know, <laughs> it, it kind of looks cool, right? Like that's the primary thing. I don't need to know who these characters are. It's not relevant. Whereas in the comic, it is about this character and I need to tell that. So yes, it's abstract, but I'm also trying to tell a little bit of the story that is going on inside. Now you could do the cover any way you want, but this is a good example where we kind of move a little bit in the middle. This is an abstract idea. This scene never really happens in the comic, right? But we are talking about an idea that is a little bit more narrative based. We can see that she's here. These characters are here. They're all facing the camera for some reason. That doesn't make any sense, but we can see the forest guardians in the tree above. And again, this is a wraparound cover, right? So again, interesting mix, but this one is inherently more narrative based, even though we are leaning into a much more, yeah, sort of abstract idea still. As we, you know, are going into the book itself, what you'll find is that this is my real contention with abstract versus narrative composition is I kind of can't try and make all of these panels just look cool. I have to really focus on like, what is the story going on here? And in many cases, if I just tell the story, the whole thing will hopefully be interesting. But there's a lot of these panels here, right, which look aren't the best, right? Sometimes we try and make them look good, but often in the sort of mix of everything, you kind of just end up doing things that are clear. Because if you're clear and you tell the story, then the overall story, the overall book, the overall thing, the experience of reading it from page to page becomes dynamic and interesting. But it's not always the case that every single panel is a masterpiece, right? Often we're just sort of repeating things. We are, again, you know, sort of putting characters in front of others. And, and, and my job is to try and tell the story of where they are in place and time. So it just inherently becomes a little bit more narrative based. And again, with comics, in most of, most of the time, it, it becomes very, very narrative based. All right, so let's look at some artists. So first up, I think if we just try and visualize this idea of abstract versus narrative composition and, you know, to a certain degree, abstract and narrative art, if you look at someone like Lord Leighton, I, I feel like they do tend to stick in that kind of representational narrative based art. Although what you see is depending on what is represented, they are going to have to lean one way or another. When you have just an image of a portrait or a very simple, you know, sort of thing that's meant to represent some part of history or whatever, you do need to make sure that the dynamic composition and the things underlying it kind of support the feeling that you want to have, right? Again, we've got these sort of verticals and you can interpret and overlay some ideology and theory on that. Who knows? But again, there is a sense that the character is very sort of straight up and down. She looks very sort of regal. And, um, you know, again, that's sort of part of the story there. As we get towards something that, again, might be more like a landscape, I feel like this is where you need to think a little bit more about those abstract compositional ideas that we talked about. And what you might find is that there are, you know, some nice patterns and lines here. There's a nice sense of basic compositional principles that you would need to employ to make this interesting. But again, Lord Leighton does do a variety of things. And there are a couple of these really sort of epic images out there. So the more you delve into a story, right, this is a great example as well. 
here we have a woman with a sort of basket of fruit on her head. Um, very romanticized uh, sort of view of what, um, you know, like lugging a basket of fruit around would be like. Um, seems very romantic to me. But here there is no real story, but the composition is still very interesting. We have a, a lot of interesting shapes. You could probably analyze this composition and think about why it does and doesn't work. Not necessarily saying it's the most successful one out there, but the more you have something happening where we have two objects and two subjects and you can see, oh, there's like this sort of girl who's feeding peacocks, some kind like albino peacocks. Anyway, I don't know what that's about, but the question is, what is that about? That's interesting. There's something happening. As we progress and tell more story with more of a scene, what you see is that we start to think about the story more. What is this about? It's obviously not that interesting from like a dramatic point of view um, in, in terms of like, you know, it being a very pretty image, right? Like some of these are more like sort of beautiful, let's say. This one is just a scene and I feel like I'm drawn more to, th to think about who is this guy? What is this guy about? Um, and again, it is about Dante in exile, right? Um, and uh, the story is about the, the story, right? And that's the main thing that we take away from it. And I think this is just a really important delineation is that often you have simple subjects, right? Where again, we're going to remember this little story here. It's very, very subtle. We still need to have um, everything looking very interesting and yeah, a lot of sort of drama. But again, I think uh, Leighton is a good example of someone who probably works within that representational primarily sort of narrative based tradition although again what you'll find is this is not a delineation about the images and you know that narrative art doesn't have good compositional principles i think it's uh mainly a matter of what you take away from it as a viewer and what the actual artist had to think about as they went to create it right did they think about how to compose the scene and and tell the story Here's another really great example. Did they have to think about what the story was and how to compose it and how to make all of this work? How do I fit this story in a scene? Maybe there's 10 different ways they thumbnailed it and they told the story in different ways versus, you know, before you're just doing a portrait or you're just trying to say, how do I make this look interesting, right? So you're not thinking about how to fit the story in. You're just thinking about shape, abstraction, color, language, posture, etc. So anyway, I think uh, Leighton is really, really interesting example there. So let me know what you think of that. Um, I don't know whether you've sort of seen of seen Lord Leighton before. Just one of those, um, you know, sort of artists from that representational sort of romantic era. I think someone who does a really good job also of creating work in a um, sort of romantic vibe is Yoshitaka Amano. And uh, if you don't know, Amano is one of the artists who, you know, really inspired a lot of the feeling of Final Fantasy in the early Super Nintendo days. And, you know, has done a lot of sort of concept design for video games. But I think he is a really good example of someone who works very much in the abstract side of things where the images exist and work because of just the pure sort of graphic nature of them let's say there's less of a focus on you know do these things make sense right like what is this about you know he you've just kind of got like look there's just a skull painted over here there's a bunch of stuff in the background sometimes it doesn't even make sense right but there's a feeling and there's an emotion there and we respond to it and in many ways, I think we often respond to it more on an emotional level. And this is why probably like, you know, artists and, and people who are more creative with more of an, Im an imagination um, really like this type of artwork because it's evocative and it, you know, can potentially say many, many different things. But I would say, as opposed to thinking about the stories, I would say the primary thing I take away from Yoshitaka Amano's work anyway is just these feelings that come from it. It's a matter of sort of emotion and energy and whimsy and fantasy and like a feeling of otherworldliness that can only be achieved when you have these strange juxtapositions of different ideas in a single image, right? They are almost, uh, again, sort of uh, Klimt-like 
abstractions where this doesn't really make sense, but it's very interesting and we're drawn to this. And I think the way that this works is a little bit more a matter of looking at how abstract art works. So why I think this is so important is that when we're in the beginning, I think often there is a delineation between this type of work and trying to draw better, right? So one of the things that often you would find as an argument is like, you know, is is someone like Armano good at drawing, right? Because they just kind of keep drawing these sort of pin-up style images and these things. But it's important to understand that you can communicate a lot of really interesting dynamic ideas and concepts and things in this way. And that when you do have that freedom, that you can kind of create these fantastical worlds that can often transcend someone else's fantastical world, even though they're able to draw it better, right? And really make it feel like, oh, you're in a scene and there's a background here. And I think it's so important to be able to master both of these image making concepts and know when you're getting stuck up on like, should I be able to draw this better or should I just make it look freaking cool? Someone who does a really good job of combining both abstract um, and narrative compositional styles, as well as drawing in a very you know good representational way, is J.C. Leyendecker. Now, Leyendecker is one of the absolute sort of kings of illustration, and really defined a lot of what you know people really still use today in terms of image making and style. And I think you can really see that it's not really about good drawing or bad drawing. It's a matter of choice, right? I think Amano evokes a very whimsical style, right? And and, and it's important to, to sort of appreciate that. That's a specific part of his work. But you still have similar levels of abstraction and narrative that go on, I think, in a lot of uh, Leyendecker's work, even though his drawing is very form-based and structural, right? You know, some would say probably his like draftsmanship and ability to render people and things was, you know, still um, at the absolute top level of what could be achieved by a human being, right? Just the ability to draw and, and create form, um, create compositions here was next level. But again, because of the medium he's working within, trying to create covers for, again, magazines back in, you know, way, way back in the, the day, again, sort of um, 1900s, 1920s, etc you needed to create very very impactful covers that both had this real strong sense of imagery and graphic design and abstraction and also tell a little story and again this just speaks to how you are limited probably in the degree of like actual narrative um, like story story that you can tell if you're just doing these types of cover images and you have to work more on the subconscious mind to create these additional ways that people are going to understand what you're trying to say. So again, good examples here. You can see that these are all sort of essentially advertisements and they're obviously telling a story. And the story is that, you know, these people are, I'm imagining they're kind of out on the town. They have style, they have panache, um, there's sort of romance here. And again, it's sort of advertising our dress shirts. Um, again, and this is a matter of being really clear with the stories that are being told. So interesting mix here, I think, of someone who is always telling a story, right? There's always a story here, similar to the way that Norman Rockwell kind of uh, followed up this idea. There's always a little story, but we're not really being too real about it. We understand that there is a whimsy to the way that these are composed and you do need as an artist, if you wanna do this, to kind of think more symbolically. How do I combine all these things? How do I get all these things in the image? And I think that you have to be able to do both of these things really well to create this type of amazing cover work. And yeah, I mean, the, the, the amount of just crazy, really good covers that just keep coming it's just insane how many just amazing images he created throughout his life. But again, it's not about how good you are at drawing or whether you're good at this or that. This is all about conscious choice and what the artist is thinking about, what the artist's intent is as they go to create the image and how that kind of relates to what actually gets taken away by the viewer as the primary message. Again, 
all of these things are going to grab you from across the room. They're going to make you buy this freaking magazine. They're going to make you really interested in it. And they're going to tell a little story, but not too much of a story. Because, again, that's not the point. Another artist who I think does a really good job of mixing these things up is Alex Toth. And Alex Toth is someone who I think is known for having very good design sense. All of these images are nicely designed. There's a sense of graphicness to them. But in this case, I think they all serve a story. And I think the story comes first. And we'll talk a little bit about, again, the reason why I think this is so important. This seems like a small point. Abstract versus narrative. It seems like, look, you're, you're kind of splitting hairs. I am, but I think this is often the key to unlocking a better way that you think about your art. I think all of these things have excellent graphic composition, excellent abstract composition. Look at the shapes, right? The way that the, iconog like the, the iconography, the symbolism, the texts, the sort of energy, right? The directional nature. It's almost like these panels look like a little vignette of um, what those compositional um, pages we saw in creative illustration are, right? They're all, it's literally like, you know, how you would use that idea. Like, oh, this is going to show direction this way. And this is going to show that, you know, this is kind of going this way. And this shows that's going that way, right? It's super basic, but very effective. And I think Toth is a great example of someone who is a story first artist, who also has an amazing ability to, you know, engage the abstract mind and make you look at the images. Again, it's not necessarily a matter of the result. It's a matter of the process. And I think this is so interesting because even though I would say someone like uh, Yoshitaka Amano is like one of my absolute favorite artists, right? Absolute, absolute amazing top level artist. I think the thing is that like Amano has tried a few try at times to create narrative work and I've read it and look, you know, I, I, I much prefer his illustration, right? And I think that is because it takes a lot of thinking about the narrative first to control and focus on the story and make sure that your abilities to compose serve the story and highlight the narrative points in each image. And it's just a completely different skill set. And I think if you take any of these frames, they're well composed. They're probably never going to win an illustration award though. But you read the whole story as a whole and the way that the abstract composition is used to support the story means that you get a really interesting sense of style and simplicity and all of these things. And just think again, he was just drawing these like silly cartoons, right? As, as sort of back of a um, car magazine, right? And they're just, every single panel is like a masterpiece in graphic composition, <laughs> design and style and class. Um, yeah, I'm a huge fan of Toth as well, as you can see. Now, the interesting thing is that a lot of these artists probably do blend abstract and narrative work because that's kind of the type of art that I like. And you're looking at my book collection. So, um, I don't have heaps of fully representational, you know, just narrative based art. Um, and I don't have a lot of pure abstract sort of artists either, but again, you, you're seeing like a, a bit of sort of how I think about this at least, but Toth very, very worthwhile studying if you're trying to think about how do I tell stories clearly but still be super stylish. It's also worth considering that you don't necessarily have to be one thing or another thing. I think Frank Frazetta is a great example of someone who has done quite a good job of both and I think it's often your ability to combine these concepts when you need to that will allow you to create really, really high level good results. Now, there's a couple of really interesting things about Frazetta that I think shed some light on this concept for us that I'll go over as we sort of progress here. But if you're not sure um, or you don't know a lot about Frazetta's history, again, I'm a huge Frank Frazetta fan, so apologies if you're like, yeah, 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 just, you know, calm down. <laughs> One of the interesting things about Frazetta is that he spent a large portion of his career actually drawing these kind of funny animal comics and also ghost um, drawing for, um, I think it's uh, Al Cap on Little Abner, which was a, a comic, a sort of a strip comic that went on for a while. So he has a really, really strong ability to create narrative work that is based upon his background as someone who wanted to become a 
comic book artist. And I think that's because being a comic book artist where you have a strip in a paper was like, you know, the, the ultimate goal for most artists back then. But again, he has a good ability to serve a story with good graphic composition. And I think that's the foundation. But interestingly, I think he also, and I think part of the thing that he said is like, this is really hard, right? What, what Frazetta is typically known for, though, are these types of images that really did break through uh, a boundary, a cultural and um, sort of artistic boundary um, at the time. Again, lots of people copy this. So now this imagery seems like, oh, yeah, 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 it's just that type of stuff. But Frazetta really sort of pioneered this whole idea. And why it's so interesting is that he really was able to straddle those things. And when it just comes to saying, hey, you know what, I'm just going to make something look really, really cool and impactful, he could kind of step back and just do it. And the other interesting thing about a lot of these covers that, you know, is actually talked about in these books, if you sort of read it, is that frequently the book covers for something like, again, the Conan sort of books that he would do, didn't really often have a huge amount to do with the actual story. Now, obviously all these kind of scenes happened in the story, but often the sort of just way that the artist was saying, you know what, I'm just going to make a really, really impactful cover. And I think this is like a classic example. I think this is one of the original ones that he did. And you can actually see here is the thumbnail for it that was, look, this looks more like a scene. But the thing that he went with and the thing that really set him apart and put him on a different trajectory and made him, I think, one of the you know most important artists uh, that we've sort of had for a long time is his ability to just say, I'm going to paint the feeling of Conan. And the only way you can kind of do that is with this abstraction. And I think it's so important to understand that artists before had illustrated these things, but they were stuck in a frame of thinking, but I got to like be a camera because cameras are good. That's what we're trying to do. And it was only through, as I keep saying, delaminating yourself from like, look, what's real versus what can I make someone feel through just kind of placing a whole bunch of weird things, right? Like the background here, it feels like his Conan, right? Here's all this kind of blurry stuff. And all we know is just like his posture. Um, and you see this kind of weird fantasy stuff in the background that's all kind of like vague, right? It, it has a sense of imagination and strength that, again, worked as a cover. It worked to give you a feeling for what's inside. But a lot of editors probably originally would have rejected this because it, it doesn't sort of show a specific scene from the book. And I think it was always for his editor's ability to lean into what looked awesome and looked cool that made his work, you know, sort of stand out. And really this, um, you know, in many cases, it was said that, you know, the work that he was creating on the cover transcended the work inside a lot of the Pulp Fiction, potentially with the exception of Robert E. Howard's um, work, which, um, although it hasn't aged that well um, from a cultural standpoint, I, I think it is actually like a really, really, really good example of um, creative writing. Um, anyway. The point here is that although there is always a story to all of these things, it is a simple story and Frazetta's ability to work on the abstract ways that we might feel like, oh, there's this, look at this kind of weird mix of like alien, creepy crawlies, right? This is actually a very, very good way to illustrate the feeling that you would get from reading a Robert E. Howard book, um, a sense of uh, Lovecraftian mystery. And you can only do this by just kind of drawing cool stuff and making sure the shapes work. Um, and I think that's something that's well worth looking at with Frazetta. He had the ability to do both, and I think that's often what allowed him to transcend um, what otherwise would have been very sort of pulp, cheap, sort of tacky work. And it's why people find it, I think, so hard to imitate his specific um, sort of series of emotions. I think he had control of a lot of different sort of elements of art. If we go back and look at some much more representational and I think still, again, narrative-based work, we can look at uh, Lawrence Alma Tedima. And in this case, we're seeing very much that, uh, again, when were these sort of done? 1865, that's kind of, I think it's sort of Victorian era art. And you're just dealing with this, trying to tell these stories of like, this is a scene that would have happened, right? Um, from mythology, from history. 
and the artist is telling. And the reason I sort of bring this up is like it, it's done in this really painterly way, and 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 the, the composition, the technical ability, the technical ability, the reality of it is is all next level, right? I mean, let me know what you sort of think of this, but you know, if if you see a lot of really high end concept art, right, a lot of people were referencing this, right. <laughs> Um, I think now they often reference other concept artists, but it was these images that really inspired people to create these epic scenes in concept art. Um, and, you know, anyone who's into this type of work has, has studied um, Tedima's work um, intensively. You're primarily thinking about the story. What is happening here? What is this about? Yes, it's composed very well. Yes, it's drawn perfectly. Um, these things are absolutely huge. Uh, you know, like one by two meters. Some of these are like sort of five meters. Um, but yeah, huge. And if you see them in person, again, super, super impressive. The point here is that these are about the story. The primary thing we take away, despite them being, you know, created with this next level of craft, the thing that we remember and take away, for me anyway, is the story. What would it have been like to live in Egypt back then? The detail with which everything is sort of rendered, the interesting way that it's sort of composed. Again, a very abstract image here, but super, super interesting. And again, just the detail is always next level. There's some of these that are just crazy where you look at like how much he would have had to study all these different things to really get a feel for what it would be like, right? This really is historical illustration. Um, and yeah, super, super impressive that this was able to be done. But again, what we're done, what we're focusing on, I think, is the story, is the narrative here. There's multiple characters, there's multiple things going on. Some of these are bigger, some of these are rendered with more detail. But in all of these scenarios, you're seeing what simply wouldn't be possible in any other way to experience is to take like a window into a potential idea of what it would be like to live in this historical time. Also interesting to note, again, a lot of these, although they're very sophisticated in the way they're drawn, they're, they're often just one point perspective, very, very simple um, fr from a technical drawing perspective, just expertly, expertly created, expertly executed. Um, and yeah, just look at all the crazy detail there, right? Um, like how, how did he... How did he must have had a model or something to figure out what's going on there? Um, I would just draw a whole bunch of sticks coming out the side. Anyway, there's always good composition. We're always using these rules that you see in a book such as um, creative illustration. That's why they were created to understand, right, like the, the, the way that you kind of make sense of a complex image. But again, I think the thing that he would have had to think about is what was that moment in time? What was that moment in mythological um, sort of history, right? What was that sort of fantastical idea? How do I communicate that? How do I tell that to people? How do I get my version of that onto the page, onto the canvas, onto the wall, and share my vision of you know the majesty of antiquity, right? Again, very romanticized <laughs> view of it. Uh, seemed to be a lot of sort of wallowing around in uh, um, you know nice white robes, but anyway, you know that's his view of it, right? And you get to see it and amazingly right these things still hold up right these things look better than any 16k you know christopher nolan film right <laughs> with like a cr crazy amount of imax detail um still you know hard to match this type of imagery hundreds of years later so let me know what you think about this again whether this helps you to frame you know the way that you view different illustrations and the different types of jobs that you might have what type of artist are you, right? It's very hard to kind of figure these things out in the beginning. But again, just before we sort of go, we'll look at one of the best examples, I think, of someone who manages to tell story with a very, very abstract compositional sort of framework, and that is James Jean. So this is the Fables covers, where he created a whole pile of different covers for the Fables series of comics. And uh, yeah, you know, it was said by many people that you know, you just buy this comic for the cover, right? That's how good it was. And I think the other thing that's very worth studying about James Jean's early kind of illustration work is, you know, he always shows the process and you can see he has a meticulous attention to detail with coming up with different ideas and really 
um, making sure that he is very sure about what's going to be in here. So none of this stuff is here by accident, let's see. All of these concepts and all of these things tend to be in the original idea and they sort of make it through to the finished product. And, and his, he shows a lot of process. It's really useful. I, I always found his process steps to be extremely enlightening, both from an artistic standpoint, because I think he is one of the best kind of artists, artists that is around today. He was also a consummate illustrator, right? He was able to deliver on the thumbnail, right, super reliably. And that's, I think, really, really challenging to do, to get that mix of design, right? Sort of the avant-garde nature of this illustration to be able to tell the story um, that I think was sort of part of this and to change style frequently. But again, I think it's a good example of someone who has really mastered the ability to tell a story that is evocative in a similar way to someone like Leigh and Decker, although in this case, I think more abstract and a little bit weird and psychedelic, to be able to communicate those ideas consistently and have a high level of sort of artistry at the same time. So it's a good example of being able to tell stories that I think are very hard to tell just with a scene. And this is where, again, we start to verge a little bit more into what I would consider to be art, right? We're transcending just simple representation this is, you know, something that is going to be hard for, you know, someone to recreate, right? To distill all these different ideas into a single image that looks really good is going to grab your eye. So if you're interested in this particular type of imagery, I think James Jean is definitely worth looking at. And if you're just an artist, I think looking at any of his kind of books where he shows the process is super valuable because you see how much all of these things were planned and all this stuff happens by accident. Um, yeah, so so many covers here that again really sort of inspired me and these sort of ideas of the graphic design and mixing these things, trying to get all this happening is uh, super useful and has inspired me a huge degree as has, you know, basically everything he does. If you look at his more modern work, you can see that he has veered a little bit more into the abstract. His modern sort of career I think is more as a fine artist and he you know just sort of does stuff that looks cool it doesn't have necessarily the same amount of narrative but again I think it's often his ability this is similar to Frazetta I think it's often people's ability to work within these frameworks that gives them the discipline to be able to be more free with their thinking as well um, at least that's my sort of conjecture I have no idea I've never met James Jean never spoken to James Jean but again that's my um, sort of amateur uh, analysis from the outside. But anyway, I think these are really, really good examples of someone who has mastered both the narrative and the abstract compositional ideas and is able to combine them to create something that kind of transcends language and time and space. And again, similar to Leigh and Decker and other great illustrators, is able to tell stories in a single image that are, again, bigger than the image itself. Anyway, there we go me rambling about art for, I don't know, quite a while. Hopefully this one was interesting. Let me know what you think about this idea and whether going through these sort of helps you to frame up these concepts of illustration and how they're important or not important to you. For me, this has been a major challenge to try and understand and piece through this because I tend to be a little bit on the intellectual, over-intellectualizing art side of things. And it was really hard for me to understand like how someone like James Jean, how someone like Frazetta would be able to tell such interesting stories in single images and like why that works. And again, I sort of wanted to be a comic book artist. I wanted to be an illustrator. I wanted to do this. I wanted to do that. I didn't really know, right? So I think this has sort of helped me as I was showing in the beginning to be like, okay, this project needs a lot of abstraction. This one needs a lot, needs a lot of narrative. And I kind of know how to kind of handle those both in my career. So hopefully this will allow you to do the same thing. As I said, though, let me know um, if you've got any follow-up questions, etc. And I'll see you down below in the comments. Thanks for watching. Happy drawing.